Absolutely. Um, this is a, a country that is still sitting on about 20% of Ukrainian soil. And I think that is sobering. We view the events of February and March uh, correctly. It's a significant defeat for Russia. It was defeated in the Battle of Kiev. Uh, it was not able to take and still is unable to take the entirety of Donetsk province, which is, of course, one half of Donbass. It has been forced out of Kherson in the south and Kharkiv in the north or, or sorry, the east. But ultimately, um, it is still sitting on large chunks of Ukraine, and it is systematically, week by week, every Monday, uh, almost like clockwork, destroying a substantial amount of Ukraine's electricity grid as temperatures drop to below zero in hard conditions. And so I think this is by no means a conflict that has run its course or a conflict in which Russia is definitively defeated. Yeah. You know, if we look at, say, for example, Bakhmut, a city now that's been called the meat grinder for how bloody the conflict is, again, very few gains. So why does Russia continue to push on there? I would point to a couple of reasons. One of them is Bakhmut is the gateway to the two big cities of Slovyansk and Kramatorsk. These are industrial cities, very important cities, and Russia can no longer attack them from the north because it lost Kharkiv. So therefore, it's attacking them from the south. Bakhmut is part of that. Um, I would also say that Bakhmut is um, in a way, part of pinning down R Ukrainian forces. Ukraine is still, uh, in some way, it still has the initiative. It's still trying to attack. And by forcing pressure on Bakhmut, the Russians are forcing Ukraine to pin down their forces on the defensive along this 40 kilometer stretch of front in Bakhmut and to the south, and indeed to the north as well. But the last reason is, is more interesting, which is that Bakhmut is kind of a political microcosm of this war. It's being prosecuted by the Wagner Group, the, the the attack in Bakhmut, which is a pro-Kremlin mercenary organization that has done much of the heaviest fighting in Donetsk. And in a way, the, the founder of the Wagner Group, a man called Evgeny Prigozhin, who, who is a kind of warlord slash uh, corrupt Kremlin-linked politician, an ex-convict, is trying to prove to Putin that I can deliver for you on the battlefield in, in an area where your regular army has failed. So the, the meat grinder of Bakhmut, which looks to us as being pointless and bloody and kind of quixotic, is, is partly about um, uh, the internal politics of Russia as much as anything to do with military strategy. Yeah, but, but to that point, it, it indicates just how, you, how little Putin has been able to defend on his own forces, some of whom have been now in prison because they don't even want to fight. We've seen that retreat so quickly. It, it, is, it is not a Russian-backed war in terms of the people. So he's sort of clutching on to these straws of how to continue this offensive. But these are fairly powerful straws. I will say that, you know, um, when I when we look at popular social media images of mobilization, it's very easy for us to make fun of Russian forces who have been thrown into the field without boots, without equipment, without training. Uh, they're young, you know, conscripts who have no wish to be there. And all of that's completely correct. I think what we mustn't uh, forget is that that raw mass can still have an impact on the battlefield. Um, the Economist, my colleagues at The Economist have some, done some very important interviews with Ukrainian leaders this week that we're going to publish in our in our story, our cover stories later in the week. And what they're telling us is that if you look at Bakhmut uh, and you look at, sorry, if you look at the offensives around uh, sort of other parts of Donbass, Russia's mobilized recruits being thrown into the battle has slowed down the Ukrainians because ultimately even poorly trained recruits can still hold a rifle and fill in a trench. And the Ukrainians are sincerely worried about Russia building out new battalions and brigades out of sight in eastern Russia that may once again present a renewed offensive threat to the Ukrainians in the spring, uh, or even sooner, perhaps in February or, 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 or early March, uh, even perhaps later in the summer and another attempt on Kiev. So um, it's easy to say these mobil this mobilization won't yield anything, but I can tell you the Ukrainians are worried about the wave of units they may face next year. They are not taking it for granted. They are not underestimating Russia. Yeah, and that is an important thing to remember. You know, as you point out, Ukraine has been more daring. They even attacked a hotel where some of those Wagner mercenaries were. Um, 
what do, what do they have to do to counter this to what you've just described almost Russia's counteroffensive springing up? Well, I would say two or three things. One of them is, first of all, keep up supplies. They need more supplies from the West. They need this desperately. The second thing is they need to make sure they spend the winter wisely. Because, for example, that attack that you alluded to was a high Mars rocket attack on a Wagner barracks in a place called Melitopol, which is a very important city in Zaporizhia province in the south. And it's a target for the Ukrainians. It's, it, it's in a way, it's kind of the staging ground for any attack on Crimea to the further to the south. And those that advantage Ukraine has is precision guided weapons like HIMARS that Russia does not have in the same way. So they have to spend the winter steadily, systematically, methodically imposing attrition on the Russian force so that it cannot reconstitute for those winter months. And the last thing I'll say is that they need to choose the timing of their attack very carefully. If they go too soon, even if they can get supplies, even if they can get weapons, which is by no means guaranteed, if they go too soon, they might fizzle, take heavy casualties, and open themselves up for the Russians then to counterattack. If they go too late, they may be pinned down by the Russians attacking with those units that we just talked about. So they have to get their timing spot on. Mm. Uh, and I, I think you know we should be optimistic because they are getting a lot of help from the West in that planning and in that assessment process. Yeah. But from what you've described, you know, this is, this is not a conflict that seems to have any diplomatic chance for resolution. Do you see it grinding out for years to come? Well, it could grind out for years, um, but I would I would say we shouldn't try and look too far beyond the summer months. I will say I, I see no prospect of serious or substantive diplomatic talks until the summer or so, um, because it will depend either on a Russian offensive succeeding, which I think is quite unlikely, or a Ukrainian offensive succeeding dramatically, which is a possibility, although, although by no means a certainty, or a Ukrainian offensive being attempted and fizzling in a way that clarifies Western minds and says we have to force the Ukrainians to the negotiating table. Basically, none of that's going to happen till we've seen heavy fighting next year. And so I would wait till the summer months. Um, only after that do I think we would see a change on either side. But for now, I will say um, Russia shows absolutely no indication of wanting to talk. Um, and so while we may, we may talk about the desirability of a settlement, we can talk about the importance of pushing Ukraine to talk. There is no sign the Kremlin is fundamentally open to any kind of settlement because it still thinks it can bring its numerical advantage in mobilization to bear until it is disabused of that notion um, there is going to be no psychological change in the Kremlin. Yeah. We've really appreciated your contributions. Uh, Shashank, thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me.